So we are going to talk about the great inversion of medicine, and I'm going to be presenting my case as the index case. <laughs> Haven't done it before because I'm still living through it. And uh, this is an interesting story. I uh, had a total knee replacement uh, 14 weeks ago tomorrow. But I'm, who's counting, of course? Um, and I've still got a brace on, and I'm having a hard time, uh, although that's just turned in recent days. Otherwise, I didn't think I would be able to make it here from San Diego. This uh, started actually when I was a, a teenager. I had this condition uh, which was misdiagnosed uh, for some years. Uh, it was called OCD, and it's not the OCD you're familiar with. Uh, it's uh, osteochondritis dissecans, which is actually a very rare bone disorder, and it led to uh, destruction of both my knee joints, uh, and I had to have bilateral surgery just before starting medical school. And I was told at the time of the surgery that I would need knee replacements probably a couple of decades later. I was able to eke out four plus decades later, which was great, but eventually I had to succumb because I didn't respond to things like cortisone injections and hyaluronic acid that's recombinant, synovial fluid. <clears throat> Finally, I went to an orthopedist who I had referred many patients to successfully, and I said, uh, what are the risks of this procedure? Because I'm really at the, at the end of the line. He said, well, there's only one risk, and it's that's infection. It's 1% risk, and uh, because you've had prior surgery, 2%. Other than that, you should be better than new by four to six weeks after surgery uh, because you're thin, you're fit, you're relatively young compared to the average age of person, people that get total knee replacement. Anybody here had a total knee replacement? Okay, well, I just want to warn you, don't get this operation so easily. Uh, 750,000 is the most common orthopedic operation in the United States, the most common. And most people do pretty well, but I didn't. So after the surgery uh, that was done, I, uh, you know, you have, a, you have home physical therapy, that's part of it. It's actually very intense, and they try to flex the knee, and you want to scream so loud that they could hear you in the next zip code. It's really tough. And they want to extend the knee. It's a kind of really difficult physical therapy to try to get it moving uh, because there's a lot of uh, uh, fluid and edema and pain. And for the first two weeks, I was on Percocet and Zombify. But then I go to physical therapy, intense physical therapy. That's the normal procedure, uh, three times a week for an hour, the same sort of thing, very serious manipulation of the joint to try to get flexion and extension, and then all sorts of exercises at home to do the same thing, weight-bearing and trying to build up the strength of the muscles and get the knee moving. Well, this wasn't working, and by the time I re went back for a repeat appointment, um, things were not looking good, and uh, I was told to have even more intensive physical therapy. And I continued not to improve. In fact, got worse. So uh, my wife was doing a web search, and she found this book called Arthrofibrosis. Now, I had never heard of this term. I spent most of my career studying atherosclerosis. So this was kind of a new thing. I said, oh, and everything now kind of clicked because that's what I had. And uh, this book kind of gets you a little depressed. This is the first page of the book. And basically it says, arthrofibrosis is a disaster. <laughs> Trying to deal with arthrofibrosis is extremely time consuming and affects all portions of a patient's life. Yes, yes. So now I had a diagnosis, and then the next time I saw their orthopedist, I said, uh, my wife was able to diagnose through the web, and she's not a doctor, and I have arthrofibrosis. He said, oh yes, that's a complication that occurs in about two or three percent of people. Now. I had six years prior to this whole thing, I had a frozen shoulder. Now, frozen shoulder is an excessive fibrosis to a relatively small injury of the shoulder joint. And it doesn't happen in men, unless they're diabetic usually. It's much more common in women. But that's a tip off between the OCD and the fibrosis of the shoulder that I would be high risk for this complication. But it was never mentioned. Never heard of it before, and now I had it, and had it bad. And the treatment of choice is intensive physical therapy. <laughs> so what was I told to do? Have more intensive physical therapy. So I would go each session, and it was physical torture. And I would be, you know, uh, walking wounded. I couldn't even walk after the, uh, ending it. And it would my blood pressure and heart rate would go up just thinking about going for the session. 
And this is what it looks like by arthroscope. It's all this fibrous tissue in the knee, all this white adhesion scarring in the knee. And it really limits motion. It leads to all sorts of inflammation and fluid and everything. And that's why I have this brace on here three and a half months out. Now, the rescue came Sunday. So I was just having an abysmal situation. I didn't think, in fact, you start to realize, you, 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 you try everything. I went for acupuncture, electroacupuncture. I, I tried uh, curcumin, uh, tart cherry, you name it. I tried it, cold laser, everything that had no data. And I'm actually kind of evidence-based, and I tried anything, because <laughs> you're desperate, desperate. No wonder people try all these things, and no wonder people kill themselves with chronic pain that doesn't get managed. It really takes over your life. So this Sunday, from a friend in San Diego, said, you have to visit this physical therapist. She has 43 years of experience, and she'll see you and help you. And I eventually got uh, to see her on Sunday. And she put me on a whole new, different program that was for people that are prone to fibrosis. And it's totally different. None of the things I was doing, in fact, everything I was doing was wrong. And it was a vicious cycle of more and more inflammation. So now I'm on the rescue mode, and uh, thanks to her. And by the way, this is her note that she gave me to summarize her recommendation. This is individualized medicine. Okay? This is understanding a person from their whole history and, how to, and examining the knee and everything and now getting me on track, and now I'm, I'm on the road to healing, thank goodness. Now, why is this, what does this have to do with the great inversion of medicine? The topic this afternoon. This is a paper that was published in 1969. It's called patient, Possibilities of Patient-Centered Medicine. That was the first time that phrase was used. We use it all the time these days. We have no idea what we're talking about. There's no patient-centered medicine. Uh, by and large. But what he wrote was, the patient, in fact, has to be understood as a unique human being. So for the example I just gave you of myself, instead of having the, the typical routine physical therapy that works for most people, I needed a different one that was tailored to me. This is not about a medication and genomics. This is about just physical therapy. Everything needs to be individualized. So. Uh, coincidentally, Cell, which connects, as you'll see in a moment, with cell phones, published a review I had written about the individualized medicine from pre-womb to tomb. We need to change medicine before even people are born, before they're even conceived all the way through their life. And in fact, we can make a Google map of each human being now. A map that instead, is the street, instead of the street view, the satellite view, the traffic view, it's of the different layers of medical information that define each of our medical essence. And that includes uh, the, the external features, the phenome. It includes the physiology through sensors, the anatomy through scans, and all the different biologic omics, the DNA, the protein, the RNA, the metabolome, uh, the metabolites, the epigenome, the side chains of the DNA, the microbiome and the exposome, which is the environment, which we can quantify today. And so people have been defined, all these layers being integrated, and that is a critical way to deliver better medical care. And it's not just a one-shot deal. In fact, this can be done at many stops along the way. And so a, a colleague of mine said, I need to change the title of this from pre-womb to tomb to from lust to dust. <laughs> and the whole idea is, we should be taking into account things before we even conceive a baby all the way through one's life. I'm not going to go through all this, but the defining human being is not a one-off phenomenon. Maybe the sequence is, but many other features change, are dynamic uh, during one's life. Now, what does that have to do? Thomas introduced this precision medicine initiative. This is the, uh, what Ob uh, President Obama uh, announced at the January 2015 State of the Union address a major initiative, the largest and most ambitious medical research program in history, to enroll a million participants. Hopefully many of you will decide to enroll. Enrollment will start towards the end of this year, and it, over the next four years, a million people will enroll. And the NIH uh, has selected uh, Mayo Clinic for the biospecimens, uh, Vanderbilt 
to do the analytics and uh, us at Scripps Research Institute to handle the rest of the uh, many functions regarding the participant facing and data uh, to the participants. One of the critical elements of this is that the data goes to the participant. If you have a sensor, that data goes to you. If you have microbiome analysis, uh, that, et cetera, goes back to you. That hasn't been typical of medical research. And we have a lot of different partners that are shown on this slide to execute this really big charge of uh, getting uh, new types of data in the real world through sensors and through sequence and through other means uh, to uh, define a new type of medicine, precision individualized for the future. Now, uh, th as mentioned just yesterday, the $207 million grant was publicized. It's one of the largest grants uh, in the history of NIH, and it shows how serious the NIH in this country is and has broad bipartisan support to go to this new level of medicine, of defining each individual at unprecedented uh, levels. Now, cell, I mentioned because it turns out the smartphone is the center of so much of this. It is so powerful, and I won't go into much depth of it, but I think you know, not only has it changed your daily life, but it's going to be the future of medicine in so many respects. Because sensors attached to it, you can do lots of labs today, and soon in the next year or two, most labs will, can be done, routine labs through a phone. You can do imaging. You can do ultrasound imaging of the entire body through a smartphone. High resolution, the same quality as in a hospital or, or, or out, outpatient clinic lab. Most of the physical exam can be done through a smartphone. The medical rec records could be accessed. The cost could be looked at through the phone of what you're going to undergo. Medications and the interactions with your DNA. And of course, you can summon a doctor at any time. And so we have this medicalized smartphone in the making. And many of the points of this are already there. And this will be filled in gradually more and more over the next few years. So your smartphone that you rely upon for so many other things is going to become the center of your health in so many respects, if you so desire. And that's very exciting. And it's not just the phone. It's also these other wearables like the watch and that you can get your glucose looking at your watch any second. And it changes what you eat when you are seeing your glucose uh, uh, on, your, on your watch in a glance. And it just it changes the fact that this will be done in the years ahead at cost of having a sensor on that are cheaper than doing finger sticks and a whole lot more palatable to have continuous glucose through a watch or phone. Now, just uh, last month in Macworld, it talked about how the Apple Watch saved my life. Well, that's a very crude device to save one's life. But already now, this is a patient who just sent me his electrocardiogram the day before yesterday. I've had actually four patients this week sending me the cardiograms through their smartphone. And instead of going to the emergency room, they have a $69 uh, attachment to their smartphone. They can do their cardiogram, send it to me. Uh, it already has a diagnosis. You see on there it says atrial fibrillation. But the question is what to do, and it preempted the need to go to the emergency room. We can do this, handle this remotely, especially in an established uh, patient. So this is one example. You can do a six-lead cardiogram through a smartphone today, and essentially you can even do a 12-lead if you know where to put the uh, sensor, which is a full electrocardiogram. Now, the time it takes to get a primary care doctor in the United States, an appointment, averages 2.6 weeks. Averages. If you're in Boston, it's over six weeks. And when you get to this appointment that you've waited so long to get, how long is the average time in the waiting room? 61 minutes is the average, okay? So people are starting to stand up to this. They say, this is not right. I waited all this time to get an appointment. Then I have to be dissed at the waiting room even. So this attitude is changing as this video captures. Miss Kelly, the doctor will see you now. Uh, can you let the doctor know that I'll be with him shortly? Huh? I am getting a lot of work done. Your Wi-Fi is very fast. But he's ready for you now. I'll be with him as soon as I can. Is she ready? Not yet. But you're next. 
Like that? <laughs> yeah. That's actually derived from a Cox communication advertising their Wi-Fi, but it couldn't be a better representation of the great inversion of medicine. <laughs> well, you can get to see a doctor in 2.6 seconds. Why would you wait for 2.6 weeks at the same cost as the copay it would be to see that doctor 2.6 weeks? Telemedicine is taking off. And there are now so many companies proliferating to offer these services, and employers <laughs> are behind this. It's cheaper than uh, physical visits because lab tests and other scans and everything else can't be ordered through telemedicine so easily. But it's even beyond that. You can Uber a doctor to your house. These apps, that you just uh, tap on them, and in a matter of minutes, you can have a doctor show up to your house, and the same type of copay as you would pay to have to go to a doctor's appointment. And one of these is really big in California, especially in San Diego. It's called Heal. I found out that it was backed by Lionel Richie. So I wrote to him, I said, well, why didn't you call it all night long? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, doc, it's all day long, too. But see, these things are really popular. I don't know if they're going to do well from a business standpoint, but the doctors really like going to the homes, and the patients obviously love this. What an inversion this represents. So now people want to get their data. But you know, this is a, a movement. Give me my data. It's my data, but I don't have it. Something wrong with that picture. Well, in 49 states, except for New Hampshire, seen in blue, they don't even know it in New Hampshire. They own their data. They don't even know it. No other state is, is such that people own their data. It's owned by doctors and hospitals. But it's your data, and you can't even get it, or you have to pay to get it. That's not right. That has to change. And so this whole thing about doctor knows best, medical paternalism, the doctors owning the data. It's their data. They generated it, right, even though it's your body and you're paying for it. That has to change because humans are underrated. Some doctors are overrated. So we have to change. And the combination of humans with machines, as depicted on this cover, is what it's all about. It's not just about the person, it's about the AI and the computing support that each person will have in the future. And this has already, because digital assistants are in high gear, and they haven't gone medical yet, really. But they will, because this march of the machines is marching to medicine. And all these different companies are working in the medical space to get AI and to get this support to uh, uh, the consumer, to the patients to be able to deal with information that they generate, not generated uh, by a doctor. So this is just a table to summarize all of the different trends that are happening very quickly now. I'm not going to go through them all, except these, this diagram to leave you with this. We can achieve patient-centered, individualized medicine. I could have been given the information about my risk for arthrofibrosis and the reasons why I was at risk, and the right management for that condition. But I didn't get any of that, and I'm kind of in the medical community. That doesn't speak well for what people, information that they rightfully should have at their fingertips on their phone or other mobile device. So we can get there, but in order to get there, we need to get the, the decay of doctor owning the data, doctor ordering the data, and the rise of patient-generated data in the real world, not one-off appointments, big data per individual, patient-owned data, the demise, the decay of physical office visits will be overtaken in the years ahead by virtual visits that are so much more convenient and can handle most of the routine matters and this rise of machines. So it's really exciting. Medicine is at a point now uh, which you can see where we can go to make it far improved. And having been a recent, uh, what you consider, a victim of the medical system, it's even reinforced it uh, all the more. Thanks very much for your attention.